All right, so let's walk through uh, this design together. Um, so this, uh, des this design asks us to design a shaft to support the attachments shown in figure 10.5. So what attachments are those? Let's just walk through them. So we have a uh, sheave here uh, where we have um, some difference in force, which is going to cause a applied torque. And that uh, sheave experiences, uh, because there's a difference in force at the top and the bottom due to the nature of a belt on a pulley, um, we going to have a re we're going to have a reaction force in X here and a reaction force in Y due to the weight of the shaft and the gear tooth. And when we get into gears, we'll talk about that, but in this case, we have what's called a pressure angle of 20 degrees for these gear teeth, which causes the gear force uh, here uh, to be at 20 degrees um, from the tangent of that gear face. So as we walk through here, we have this applied torque. That's what these forces are, these differences in forces. We see here that this shaft is attached with a key. Uh, we're given the dimensions of the shaft. Um, here we have these stress concentration factors here and here. Uh, we have key stresses here. We have this step here and this step here. So we're going to have to look at these different places, um, in particular place D, place C, uh, place B, and A where we have these <coughs> shaft changes. Um, and then here, this is a gear, okay? And then this gear is uh, um, fixed on with a key. Um, and we have these gear teeth and uh, the load here is on this axis. At this point, that's where the gears teeth are meshing. Um, and so we have those loads there. Okay, so this shaft as a preliminary design, has to transmit uh, two horsepower uh, at 1,725 RPMs. And this is a pretty common motor speed. Um, the torque and the force on the gear are both constant with time. Okay, so we don't have um, um, fluctuating loads because of that, but we will have fluctuating loads due to the rotation. There are no applied axial loads. Um, steel will be used because we want to get that uh, endurance limit uh, and be under the knee <clears throat> so we get infinite life. Uh, and we will, you know, take a look at the geometries, but they've already given them to us. We could go and look them up in the back of the book for the stress con static stress concentration factors. Um, so they say use um, 3.5 for the step radii and bending. Use two for the step radii and torsion, and four at the keyways. Um, since the torque is steady and the bending moment is fully reversed, we could actually use the ASME method, um, but we're not. We're good, but we will compare it, and um, we'll compare it to the general method using equations 10.8 in the book. So you can actually see the ASME method, and uh, which we're not using, we didn't cover you can see how uh, the difference in the numbers. Okay, so, so what do we do? Well, the first thing that we do is we are going to uh, convert this uh, horsepower and speed and then calculate the torque so that we can find the applied uh, torque on this shaft. <clears throat> okay, so the applied torque is um, uh, simply uh, our power over our speed, and our power is given in, as two horsepower, uh, and there's 6,600 uh, inch pounds, uh, inch pounds per second uh, per horsepower, and uh, there are. <clears throat> In uh, there's 1725 RPM, so we want to convert uh, RPMs to radians per second, and there are 2 pi over 60 uh, radians per second per RPM. Okay, so if we do that, we can get our torque in terms of inch pounds, so we get 73.1. 
or inch pounds or pound inches. Okay, so that is our applied torque. <coughs> and that a torque you see is going to be uh, zero here. Um, and then it's going to be jump up to the applied torque and then it's going to come down here and then we have the uh, torque that's picked up by the shaft so it's going to come down here. So if we look at our uh, torque uh, diagram here uh, from uh, zero to two inches, uh, which is where this is located, this shaft here, we have zero. And then if we go all the way out um, from, uh, which is six and a half inches, which is the center of the sheave, um, all the way to the end of the shaft, which is at eight inches, um, then we have <coughs> zero and then we have the applied torque and we come down here to zero okay so that's our torque uh, loading diagram and then the next step uh, is to take a look at the loads okay so we're going to have two uh, forces we're going to have a, a force that is uh, due to the let me change my pin here um, we're going to have a force that's due to the um, applied torque, okay, and that is the torque over the radius, and then the radius we're told um, here uh, at that point is uh, three inches, okay, so if we go up here, we can look at the, the different geometries. And we see that the torque, uh, the distance here, this is uh, on the sheave is six inches, so we'll just use three inches, okay? So the applied torque <coughs> over the radius is going to be our 73.1 pound inches over uh, three inches. So that gives us a force of 24.36 uh, pounds and that is in the X direction or I direction and then we have um, the uh, force here um, which we can actually calculate from the difference in the forces so if we have Fn and that's the force that's uh, due to the difference in the torque that's due to the difference in those forces it's F1 minus F2 because F1 is larger and that's the force uh, that bends the shaft because it's in the uh, transverse direction, okay? So we're gonna have this uh, forces here. And if, if you look at it, it's gonna cause bending in the shaft. Um, and then we have uh, this net force as well um, on the shaft, okay? Which is the sum of these forces. And we'll call that FS. And Fs is uh, F1 plus F2. And if we uh, solve for Fs, we find that Fs is 1.5 times Fn. Um, and in that case, it's equal to 36.54, uh, also in the I direction. <coughs> and these are pounds. Okay, so we wanna keep our units, make sure we keep our units. The uh, tangential force uh, at the gear tooth interface is going to be um, the force here, this tangential force here, and we are also told that even though this, this drawing is not to scale, this is six and this is also six um, because it's gonna contact a little bit lower. Um, so I guess we're effectively using six, but it's drawn larger, so just ignore that fact. Um, but we can find that the tangential force on the gear tooth is going to be due to that applied torque, okay, over the radius, okay, so it's going to be the same, but it's going to be in the opposite direction. So that's 24.36, uh, and in this case, it's in the J direction. Okay, so the reason that it's in the J direction has to do with uh, where that load is picking it up. Okay, so that's 
So we have these difference in forces that we can that are in this x direction. We're calling this the i for i direction forces. Okay, and then we have this component of force um, that comes down in the in that in that j direction. Okay, so we need to find that component of the force. That that force is the force that takes up that torque. Okay, but we got to find the component of that force that's in the um, tangential uh, direction to find that radial component of force. Okay, and that radial component of force is going to be just the um, tangential component of force uh, times the tangent of the pressure angle of that gear, uh, in which case this is uh, 8.87 in the I direction. So it shows up in the same direction as the um, uh, Fn and F4, Fs forces. Okay. Sorry, this was off the table. So the radial component is just Fg times the tangent of 20, um, and that's in that I direction. We can see that here. That's this component of force. Okay. So we have this negative J component of the force, and we have this I component of the force. Now, in this problem, we have to consider um, the um, both directions because at the end of the day, what we needed to do is get the magnitude of the bending moment in those planes and the magnitude of the shear, okay? And so, um, if we look at those magnitudes, okay, um, and we take these forces and look at the reactions, we'll get uh, some shear in that XZ plane where Z is along the um, shaft axis. Okay, so we have X and Y normal to that axis and Z is in the axis. So we'll have these, uh, these shear, the shear in the XZ plane due to those loads and then we'll have this shear in the YZ plane uh, due to the loads in, in uh, Y. And then we'll have the magnitude of the shear which is the magnitude of these components um, respectively, and then we'll have a moment in the XZ plane, and we'll have a moment in the YZ plane, and then we'll have a moment magnitude, and this is the moment magnitude that we got to look at at points B, C, and D in our design, okay? Points B, uh, C, and D, okay? So we have to calculate those forces. All right, so to get those forces, um, we can, you know, sum uh, our moments. <clears throat> Let me select the, uh, or deselect the uh, pin here. Okay, so we want to sum the moments. In this case, we're going to sum the moments about A. Point A here, we're going to sum the moments about A. <coughs> Okay, and it's going to be our reaction at 2 times the distance to 2, which is B in the graph, plus the uh, force in the gear uh, times the distance P to the gear, uh, plus uh, the force on the sieve uh, times the distance to the sieve, and that's going to be equal to 0. Um, if we solve for the reaction force at 2, uh, we get minus 1 over B times F G times P plus F S times Q and if we plug those values in we get that it's uh, minus 0.4 F G uh, minus 1.35 F S if we find uh, if we sum the forces at that point we get R1 plus FG plus FS plus <coughs> R2 equals zero. Um, and if we plug the, the values in uh, that we got before, we get <coughs> minus point zero point six FG plus zero point three five. Fs. Now, <clears throat> if we want to solve these equations here, we need to get an expression um, for um, 
the reactions and um, solve for FG and FS. Okay, so we can do that by um, taking the components for um, each each one of those in X and um, Y from what we found before. So if we have R1X um, is equal to minus 0 0.6 FG in the X direction, which we found earlier, plus 0 0.35 times F S in the x direction, and if we plug in those values, okay, uh, here for FS and FG, the components in I and J, okay, <coughs> then we get that R1X is uh, 7.47 pounds, and if we do the same thing uh, for R1Y, and it's minus 0.6 FGY plus 0 0.35 FSY. And if we plug those values in, we get 14.61. Uh, we can do the same thing for R2 in the X direction, which is minus 0 0.4 FGX minus 1.35 FSX, which gives us uh, minus 52.87 pounds. And if we do R2Y, which is minus uh, 0.4 FGY minus 1.35 FSY, we get 9.74 <coughs> pounds. Okay. So um, now that we have the reactions for R1 and R2, we can actually find um, the magnitudes for R1 and R2, and then use those in our load equations, okay? And our load equations just come from the load equations for the beam diagram, where we have uh, the load is equal to the load uh, times Z minus and in this case, we're going along the shaft. So it'll be Z minus zero, because that's where that load is applied. We'll use our brackets for our singularity functions. Uh, plus FG, and that uh, load is applied at uh, Z minus two. That's where that, that load is applied. Sorry, I forgot my singularity brackets. And that's a uh, point load, so it's minus one. And then <coughs> we add the reaction at 2, which is at z minus 5 minus 1 plus fs times z minus 6.75, where that load shows up to the minus 1. Okay, so this is just this is our singularity function where we take those point loads, it's the reaction, the forces uh, at the gear, fg the reaction at two and the force from the sheaf. So these are where those, those loads are, are coming in to the shaft. And when we use these singularity functions, then it allows us to integrate them using the relationships between the singularity functions. So we get the expression R1, okay? And then we integrate this to minus one becomes a zero. So it's a Z minus a zero to the zero plus FG Z minus two to the zero plus R2 z minus 5 to the 0 plus fs z minus 6.75 to the 0 okay and we can do the same thing for the moment diagram okay in this case we get r1 z minus 0 to the 1 plus fg z minus 0 z minus 2 to the 1 plus r2 z minus 5 <clears throat> to the 1 plus fs z minus 6.75 to the 1. All right. So now we have our moment diagram and that gives us, that's where we can find our bending stresses. And recall that when we have the, lo when we have the loads included 
in here we and when we integrate from our load to our moment we don't have to include the um, integration constants for C0 and C1 because they're automatically accounted for when we include the loads in the load di the loading function. All right, so what we do is <clears throat> we can find the, those uh, loads um, here, the loading functions, okay, in X and Y and X, X, Z and Y, Z planes, and we can just take the magnitude. The magnitude is the square root of both in, of the components squared, okay? So we can use this R1X and R1Y in these equations and then find our moment uh, values at those locations along the diagram. And if we take the magnitude of the moment at those different locations, we can we, see, we get this diagram here. And the, the places we care about the most are A, B, and C. And so if we do that, and then we calculate those moments at those locations, A, B, and C, we find um, that <clears throat> the moment at B is uh, plus or minus 33 uh, pounds per inch. And the reason we have these plus or minus is because we have this fluctuating load as it rotates along, okay? And then we have the moment at C, which is uh, 63 uh, pound inches. <clears throat> and then the moment at D which is uh, plus or minus nine uh, inch pounds or pound inches. <clears throat> All right, so now the next step in the design is to calculate our uh, endurance limit, okay? So because we wanna minimize cost, we'll just pick a cheap steel. In this case, we'll check SAE 1020 steel, and it has a SUT of 65 KPSI, and we know that our endurance limit, our uh, uncorrected endurance limit, is approximately equal to 50% uh, of SUT or uh, equal to 32.5 uh, uh, kpsi. Okay, so we'll start there, and then we have to pick our load factors to correct for our fatigue uh, factor. So in this case, we have reverse loading, so the and bending, which the load factor is one. We have the size factor, um, which is equal to one for that geometry. We have our surface factor, which we know it's machined, so we can go look at the surface factor, and that's 0.84. And then we have our temperature factor, and we assume that we're in uh, ambient temperature, so our temperature factor is one. And we assume a 50% reliability, so our reliability factor uh, is also uh, one, okay? So when we uh, find our corrected fatigue strength, uh, which is C1, uh, which is all of our Cs, you know, for load, uh, size, surface, uh, temp, and reliability, um, times our uh, nominal fatigue strength, which is 32,000, 500 kpsi, then we get a corrected fatigue strength of 27,300 uh, psi. Okay. So now we have our that's that one point on the Goodman diagram that we start off with. You know where that's this point right here. <clears throat> um, and then if we look at the loading uh, due to torsion, we can leave it as one because we're correcting for it in the, uh, by calculating the volume of stress, okay? All right, so the next thing to do is evaluate the material's notch sensitivity, okay? Because we're working towards uh, getting the fatigue uh, concentration factors. So Q uh, for this material, we can either find from the equation or from the chart. Uh, we find that it's about 0.5 the notch sensitivity in bending, and Q is about uh, 0.57 in torsion. Uh, if you assume a notch radius of 0 0.01 inches, okay? 
which might be like the radius left by the machine tool. Okay, so after we have our, uh, our notch sensitivity, then we can find our fatigue factor, and our fatigue factor is based upon our notch sensitivity plus our static stress concentration factor, which we were given in the problem statement. Okay, if we solve for that, it's 2.5. <clears throat> If we look at the fatigue concentration factor in shear, it's uh, 1 plus Q times KT S in shear minus 1, and that's equal to um, uh, 2.7. Okay? And this is uh, calculated, this is, these are at point B. Okay, so if we go back up here, take a look at where we're talking about, uh, this is at point uh, B. So this is this notch right here, okay? So once we have that, um, then we can use the equation um, that we uh, showed earlier um, for the um, finding the diameter um, using that design procedure, okay? And that's taken from uh, this equation here Okay, where we have this diameter, which comes from our Goodman diagram. Um, and for the Goodman diagram, we need our ultimate tensile strength and our fatigue strength. In this case, we're using the endurance limit. So we can plug those values in, and then we can uh, use our calculated uh, stresses. Okay, so if we go back over here and take a look at <clears throat> solving this, um, then all we need to do is calculate the diameter, D1, and this is at B, and we want to know what diameter that we have to have, so it's 32, um, <clears throat> 32 times our safety factor and fatigue over pi, and that's times um, our fatigue um, concentration factor times the alternating uh, applied moment over our fatigue strength um, squared, quantity squared plus three-fourths times our uh, fatigue strength for our mean stresses times our applied torque, mean torque, times SY, which is our yield strength squared, this quantity to the one-half, uh, this overall quantity to the one-third, okay? So if we uh, plug the values in uh, at point B, and then according to the example, uh, point B should be D2, okay? So this, the moment that's applied here, this is the, the moment, the alternating moment at that location. So it's either the moment at A or B or C and then here, this is our applied torque. Okay, this is the mean torque because that's the, port, the torque that's applied. So it's non-fluctuating torque, but we have this fluctuating moment because the, the artifact is a uh, moment. And this is actually the K, this is, there should be an S here for shear, okay? So if we go through this analysis, we find that the diameter, in this case at B, should be 0.531. And if we do the same analysis uh, to find the diameter at point C, this is D1 in the example, the diameter at C, um, the diameter at C is 0.531. The ASM, using the um, <coughs> ASME method though, um, gives us a diameter of 0 0.52, which is more conservative. Um, that's at, um, sorry, <clears throat> so D1 um, in the example is um, point, D2 in the example is point C but we've been talking about point B. So the analysis is the same. Uh, I got my notation confused here for a sec. Just let me 
matrix sample. So let me just do it like this. So we can follow this same procedure, okay, and if we want to find the required diameter at point C, it is 0.531 using this approach, inches. The ASME method uh, diameter tells us it should be 0 0.52, okay. Now, uh, for the diameter at point B, <coughs> we, um, the diameter is uh, 0 0.517. Using the ASME approach, it's 0 0.444 inches, inches. And the diameter at A, uh, using the same approach, is 0 0.411 but using the ASME method, which we don't recommend because you can see here it is uh, more conservative. It's actually uh, 0 0.360 uh, inches, okay? So this is an example of where we uh, have an application, okay? Where we have uh, uh, applied uh, loads that go through the shaft we have a belt driving a uh, gear here. Because we have the belt loads in this direction, we have to consider the loads in two directions, the X direction and the Y direction. And we use those to get the magnitude of the moment as it goes through the shaft. And we use the magnitude of that moment to calculate our um, bending stresses. Because the applied torque is constant, that is our mean stresses and our alternating stresses are the alternating stresses due to the bending moment. Okay, so we have to do good bookkeeping, get the forces in each direction, get the reactions in each direction, and then we can use those to build our load, uh, shear, and moment diagrams, and then we can use the magnitude of the moment in the respective x and y directions to get the magnitude of the moment, and those are alternating moments at A. Uh, this is also plus or minus <coughs> at A, B, and C. Or, um, <coughs> at um, where, wherever we, uh, B, C, and D, wherever we want to investigate them. And then we go through this process, uh, pick a material, uh, get our, uh, in this case, endurance limit, uh, get our notch sensitivity, use the notch sensitivity to, and static stress concentrations for um, that geometry for both uh, um, static uh, stresses do the bending and shear, get our uh, fatigue stress concentration factors, and then we can use those here uh, to correct for the uh, shear due to the applied torque and the um, moment, uh, the bending moment applied at that location to get a, our diameter. And this equation came from the Goodman uh, diagram that included the safety factor here, which in this case, uh, we chose a safety factor of 2.5. <clears throat> and when we do that and we go through the analysis, we get our diameters. We can get our diameters for those locations in the shaft, and then we can use those to design the shaft and make sure that it doesn't fail.